Shannon Seals, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. Okay, uh, Iowa, for those of you who don't know, and I know people who've driven far and wide to be here, Iowa is a state with a split legislature. That leads to different approaches on how we deal with the life issue in the state of Iowa. I am incredibly grateful that people who do not agree with each other on how to deal with that issue have come together today to stand behind this microphone because there is one thing we all agree on and that is we have to stop the trafficking in dead baby parts. That is not Iowa, that is not America. It's my great pleasure to welcome your first speaker, our governor, Governor Terry Branstead. Governor? Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. It's a beautiful day in Iowa. Great to see you all here. Simon, thank you for that nice introduction. I'm pleased to be here with my fellow Iowans people like me who want to stand up for the most vulnerable, the unborn. I want to thank my friend Jennifer Bowen of the Iowa Right to Life for her tireless, worker, her tireless work in advancing the pro-life movement and organizing today's rally. I first ran for the Iowa legislature in 1972 and you may recall the infamous Roe versus Wade decision was made in January 22, 1983, after I'd just been in the legislature a few days. And I've been fighting for the pro-life movement ever since. And we're not going to quit. Like all of you, I was appalled on seeing the videos of Planned Parenthood employees haggling over aborted baby but baby body parts, the detail in which they go into talking specifically about how to keep more valuable body parts intact was truly sickening. After seeing the video, I've asked the Iowa Department of Public Health and the Department of Human Services to review any and all contracts that involve Planned Parenthood. We want to see that no tax money in this state has gone in the past or will it in the future go to fund abortions or abortion-related services. I'm pleased to report that the state of Iowa does not provide funding to Planned Parenthood for abortions, and there is not a line item in the budget for Planned Parenthood. I am proud of the pro-life legislation that we've worked together on over the years, a requirement that every woman who seeks an abortion get an opportunity to see an ultrasound. And I've seen those ultrasounds for my grandchildren, and they're powerful. We also passed parental notification should any minor seek an abortion. And in the past two years, I'm proud to say no Medicaid-funded abortions have occurred in the state of Iowa. Since 2007, abortions in Iowa have dropped 34% and Planned Parenthood has been closing some of their offices. I will continue to stand for you for life as I have throughout my entire public career. I was deeply disappointed that recently the Iowa Supreme Court sided with Planned Parenthood and against the Board of Medicine, and against the district court judge's decision on telemed abortion rules. I'm deeply disappointed in that court. The Iowa Department of Public Health and the Iowa Department of Public Services are presently reviewing contracts in which funding, in which there is funding that Planned Parenthood receives. A significant portion of that money comes from federal sources that are beyond the state's control. But we are working with Senator Ertz and supporting her efforts to change that. You have my word 
that I will diligent review all findings from those two departments and consider how we can continue to be good stewards of the taxpayers' money and working to protect the unborn. Our priority will remain the same, ensuring that women have a high standard of care with access to medical services and the voice of the unborn is also heard. <laughs> to show you my commitment on this issue, on January 22, 1984, the very first child born to a governor in office in Iowa since the very first governor of Iowa was my son Marcus Andrew Branstad. He was born on Super Bowl Sunday the 11th anniversary of the Roe versus Wade decision. He was supposed to come on the 24th of January, but he came two days early. A signal from God on the pro-life issue. And I was very proud at the pro-life rally that afternoon at the cathedral to announce the birth of my youngest son, Marcus Andrew Branstead. I want you to know, every time I look at him, I think how important this issue is and how blessed we are to have children and I want to do all I can to stand with you and work with you for the pro-life movement. Thank you and God bless you all. Thank you Governor Branstead, we really, uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, next uh, on our agenda, because this is really important at a state level, we can do things in the state. It's going to take a committed caucus in the House here to get things done. But we do know that the leadership of the state wants things to happen. Proof of that, not only do we have the governor, we have Lieutenant Governor Kim Reynolds, ladies and gentlemen. and I just want to start by saying thank you to each and every one of you for taking the time to be here and for diligently fighting on behalf of the unborn. I also want to thank uh, a good friend, Jennifer Bowen and Simon Conway, for putting this rally together by gathering people together so that we can continue to speak out. We are here today to speak out against Planned Parenthood, but most importantly, we are here in support of life. Over the past... Over the past five weeks, with the release of each new video by the Center for Medical Progress, my disgust, like yours, has only grown. We have seen Planned Parenthood executives laughing while slipping wine and talking and talking about Lamborghinis, all while discussing how they will abort babies and sell their parts. They've even gone so far as to alter the abortion procedure to preserve the organs that demand the highest price. This is a war on life, and we need to fight each and every day for life. We must, I'm speaking to the choir here, and we need the choir to sing, but we must remain vigilant vigilant soldiers focused on our mission and our message that all life is precious and that all life matters. Recently, medical professionals from across our state stepped up to protect women and to protect life. These professionals came together calling for a standard of care that would have protected women. They came together and they petitioned the Iowa Board of Medicine to stop telemed abortions. Like us, they believed women's health was being compromised and the Board of Medicine not only listened, but they acted. But Planned Parenthood didn't want to listen when it came to protecting women. They were more interested in their bottom line. I want you to know that Governor Branstad and I continue to oppose telemed abortions. We stood strongly with the Iowa Board of Medicine when they took decisive action. Planned Parenthood sued. 
sued over this while seeking to continue the telemed abortions without a doctor in the room. And despite a district court judge siding with the Board of Medicine and Iowa women, the Iowa Supreme Court chose another direction. The Iowa Supreme Court turned their backs on Iowa women and turned to Planned Parenthood. As a woman and a mother of three daughters, two granddaughters, and five grandsons, I know that women need to have access to high quality health care. And in our state, they do. As I stand here today before you, I make this solemn vow. I will always side with Iowa women and higher standards of care, always. Here in Iowa, Governor Branstad and I are committed to ensuring that no taxpayer dollars go to the abortion-related services. At the state level, Planned Parenthood does not have a line item in the budget. We are ensuring that the Iowa Department of Human Services and the Iowa Department of Public Health are thoroughly reviewing funding that goes to Planned Parenthood. But federal action may still be required to fully terminate all funding for Planned Parenthood and to shift it to other providers that will continue to provide women health services. And I want to take this opportunity to applaud United States Senator Joni Ernst for working to defund Planned Parenthood at the federal level while ensuring, ensuring that women still have access to high quality medical services. So in the meantime, this is going to take a dual track. We're going to have to fight it at every single level, as Simon said. And Governor Branstad are going to continue to do what we can do at the state level. Just this last week, we met with a group of Iowa legislators to discuss, to discuss Iowa's path moving forward. We recommended that they ask Attorney General Tom Miller to investigate whether Iowa Planned Parenthood is selling aborted baby parts like their colleagues across the country. And we're going to continue to request that they take action and investigate. As, as the Lieutenant Governor of this great state, I remain committed to the pro-life cause. I'm proud member of the leadership team of the National Pro-Life Women Caucus, and these are leaders who are stepping up to advocate and protect life and encourage women and individuals to run for office that share that common goal. We must continue to fight for the unborn and protect the sanctity of life. We must stay faithful to our cause and committed to the mission because, as Edmund Burke once said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. Keep up the fight, keep up the charge. We will win, we are winning, and with your support and your diligence and vigilance efforts, we will protect the unborn. Thank you for being here. God bless you, God bless each and every one of you. Ladies and gentlemen, the fight is uh, not just on the streets of uh, Iowa, it's on social media as well. I've just met a couple who've driven 15 hours to be here this morning. Thank you so much. Leading uh, the fight in the United States Senate to defund Planned Parenthood while maintaining high quality health care for the women of this nation is our very own Joni Ernst. It gives me enormous pleasure to welcome United States Senator, Lieutenant Colonel Joni Ernst. God bless you all. God bless you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Take a look to your left and take a look to your right and you will see that we are surrounded by those that believe in life. I love it. Thanks for coming together because not one person can do it alone. Whether it's the governor, lieutenant governor, whether it's me, whether it's our friends in the Iowa State Legislature, whether it's our friends in the Congress at the federal level, we can't do this 
without your support, without your prayers, without your well wishes. Every baby matters. Every baby matters. You know, I, thank you. I have learned a lot over the past six, seven months serving at the federal level. And I would tell you that it simply would have been a lot easier just to ignore the videos that have surfaced out there. Those videos, those gruesome videos that are exposing Planned Parenthood employees, showing them picking apart the body of an unborn baby boy to harvest his organs like a liver, his kidneys and heart. But today, we're standing up and shining a light on what is really happening behind these closed doors. This is human life. And Planned Parenthood, the nation's single largest provider of abortion services, is harvesting baby body parts, human life. Democrats and Republicans alike have called these images disturbing. The American people are shocked and horrified by the utter lack of compassion and the disregard shown by Planned Parenthood for these women and their babies. As a mother and a grandmother, the gravity of Planned Parenthood's callous and morally reprehensible behavior cannot be ignored, and that's why we are here today. I am committed, committed to defending life because protecting the most vulnerable is an important measure of any society. Recently, I offered legislation that would defund Planned Parenthood while protecting funding for women's health services. This legislation redirects federal funding taken from Planned Parenthood to other eligible entities that provide health services for women, like community health centers and hospitals. There would be absolutely no reduction in overall federal funding available to support women's health. Community health centers provide a more comprehensive primary and preventative health care services except abortion regardless of a person's ability to pay. According to the most recent data in Iowa, community health center sites vastly outnumber Planned Parenthood sites by seven to one. And meanwhile, we hear all about the wonderful services they provide. But bottom line, did you know that Planned Parenthood doesn't even provide mammograms? Not at all. But the hospitals do. The American taxpayer should not be asked to fund an organization like Planned Parenthood that has shown a sheer disdain for human dignity and complete disregard for women and their babies. These videos depict images and behaviors that are hard for anyone to defend. I am honored to join all of you today as we celebrate life. Together, we will continue to shine a light on the lack of compassion shown by Planned Parenthood for these women and their babies. Thank you. And again, 
I would remind you of Psalm 139, 13. God knit me together in my mother's womb. Every life has meaning. Every baby can contribute to this wonderful country. And I want to thank you all for being so brave in coming out against the opposition because we know again that one person is not going to change it, but one person can start it. And we've seen that now with all of you coming forward. Together, we are going to defend life, not only in the state of Iowa, but all across the United States. God bless all of you. God bless the state of Iowa. God bless the great United States of America. Thank you. By the way, uh, we should point out that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ernst actually changed her schedule so she could be here today. So we're very grateful to you, Senator, for doing that. Absolutely fantastic. And uh, seeing as I've just given her rank a couple of times, uh, a whole bunch of people who I know have served have uh, come up to me today. Uh, if you make yourself known in the crowd right now, please, that will be great. Let's give it up for our veterans, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. You fought for our freedom and uh, we are honored, honored to stand next to you today in this fight. Somebody else who has uh, done that for us today wants to be the next president of the United States. He is uh, someone I call my friend. I traveled to Israel with him about a year ago, almost in a day. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Rick Santorum. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, thank you all for being here today. It is so great to see so many people out here standing for the truth. I was on a TV show, a live national TV show the other day, and a reporter was giving my resume, and when he was reading my resume, he said, and Rick Santorum believes life begins at conception, and what started to go on, and I said, no, I don't. And he froze. He said, well, well it says here you believe life begins at conception. I said, I do not believe life begins at conception. I know life begins at conception. That's the truth. It's the truth. You go to any bio uh, biology textbook anywhere in the world, it's the truth. Why? Because our movement is founded on the truth. It's on the truth of the dignity of every human life the dignity that life not just begins at conception, but it's the obligation of a good and decent and moral society to open its arms and be welcoming to all of God's children in our society. Amen. I read a book recently by Andy Andrews. Some of you may have read it. It's a little tiny book. And the title of the book is, How Do You Kill 11 Million People? He could have retitled, How Do You Kill 55 Million People Here in America? But his book was about the Holocaust. And you know what his answer was in one simple sentence? How do you kill 11 million people? You lie to them. You lie to them. Planned Parenthood, the abortion industry, Roe versus Wade, all of it is based on a lie about when a child becomes a human being. And we see the poisonous, record, wretched, cancerous result of that lie. Every lie, we all know, we tell our kids that when you lie, then one lie needs to another lie, a lie, and another one, another one, and pretty soon you just have this poisonous web that you can't get out of. That's where we are. They always said, oh, well, you know, it's just a blob of tissue and it really isn't going to have an impact on anything else. That's a lie. And now we're seeing the consequence. When I was in the United States Senate, I spent seven years of my legislative career fighting for a ban on a 
on a procedure called partial birth abortion, where they take the baby, where they take the baby all but the head and deliver it feet first and then crush the skull. This dehumanizing, barbaric procedure. We fought. The Supreme Court said, you can't ban that. It's unconstitutional to ban it. We've heard this before from the Supreme Court. Oh, you can't do certain things and we're going to tell you that the Constitution prohibits you from protecting life, from protecting marriage and other things. Well, I didn't say no. I didn't say okay to that. When we had the opportunity, we passed another bill that banned partial birth abortion. And we sent it back to the Supreme Court with a whole laundry list of arguments saying, Supreme Court, you're wrong. Partial birth should be illegal in this country. And they voted to keep it illegal in this country, to get rid of partial birth abortion. It's important to stand up when the court gets it wrong. It's important that the other branches of government stand for the truth and tell and call the court out and get it right. I bring up partial birth abortion because if you look at the tapes of Planned Parenthood, Planned Parenthood and that doctor who described what she was doing described a partial birth abortion. What that doctor was doing in protecting these organs so they could be harvested. Think about just those terms when you're talking about a little baby. Harvesting organs from a living child who otherwise would be born alive. That's what they were doing. So when people ask me, should we defund Planned Parenthood? I say absolutely yes, but that's not enough. We need to prosecute Planned Parenthood for breaking the law. I pledge to you, and this should come as no surprise to people who have watched my career, I pledge to you that there will no, be nobody who will go into the presidency with more of a heart for the love of the little children who are forgotten in America, who will stand up and fight for them. And not just fight for them by an executive order or standing up to the court, but the important fight, the fight to get in front of the people of this country and appeal to their conscience. We're a great country. We're a loving country. We love the underdog. We love the little guy. But we haven't had leaders in this country who are willing to put that little child who's unseen, at least before sonograms, and put them out there as the little guy that America should be pulling for. Ladies and gentlemen, you give me the chance. I'll make that little guy front and center in making this country a great country again. God bless you. Thank you. Senator Rick Santorum, ladies and gentlemen, very powerful stuff. Let's, uh, let's bring a little bit of good news. Uh, because uh, on uh, Thursday, STEM Express, they're the baby dead parts middleman in the trafficking business. Uh, they lost in court to the Center for Medical Progress. This is the Truth Exposed rally. The truth will be exposed. Late yesterday, STEM Express severed all ties with Planned Parenthood, ladies and gentlemen. Every day of the week, I get to share the 50,000 watt blowtorch that is WHO Radio with my good friend, my colleague, a warrior for life, ladies and gentlemen, Jan Michelson. Thank you. 
I can't believe I survived a Simon Conway introduction. He could have said a whole bunch of stuff, but he didn't. For most of us, life, human life is precious because humans are image bearers of God. We see children as blessings of God. Why? Because godly families are intergenerational economic units. However, our pagan socialized welfare state has targeted the family, taxes away the intergenerational part, and converts the family into a provider of taxable assets for the government. So in our economy, the children are not really family assets as much anymore, but liabilities owned by the government that we are expected to raise. So fewer people get married. So fewer people have children, while at the same time, more people are dependent upon a government check. The word for a system that depends upon more productive people coming into existence while subsidizing their disappearance. There's a word for that. It's called unsustainable. So the fastest way, thank you. So the fastest way to attack that birth dearth and the abortion ethic is to dismantle the welfare state. So let me tell you one of my favorite stories. There was a man from Des Moines. He was of modest means. He had a dream. His biggest dream was to go live in a suburb somewhere with his family. He imagined a place, a mythical place, called Johnston, Iowa. Two-story, three-bedroom house, two-car gar garage near a good school. That was his dream. So he scrimped and he saved until at last he had enough money for a down payment and success. He bought a house in Johnston. He found the house, he bought it, and he rented a U-Haul truck, put all of his stuff and his family in the truck, and went to Johnston to his new house. And while he is emptying out the U-Haul, a terrible thought struck his mind. He says, I have a house. What's that school? I have a yard. That's cool. I don't have a lawnmower. I can't afford to buy one. What am I going to do? Then he thought about it. He said, well, now I live in the suburbs. Everybody in Johnston is rich. I'll just borrow a lawnmower from my neighbor. Problem solved. Well, the next door neighbor is looking out his picture window and sees the fella emptying out the U-Haul trailer. And he says, great. We have a new neighbor. Sure hope he has a lawnmower. <laughs> so this is where we are in our welfare state. The impending collapse of our welfare state will give us, if we're smart, the chance to make every child a blessing of God again. Thanks for listening. Yeah, I get to work with him every day. He's a good guy, really, he is a good guy. I want to make a prediction, uh, ladies and gentlemen. If uh, NASA's Curiosity rover today found a live, single-celled creature on a planet, every headline tomorrow morning would scream one word. It would simply say, life. However, if you have a big pie bowl with what are clearly human body parts being sifted through while people figure out exactly how much money they can make out of the carnage, that, ladies and gentlemen, is not life, apparently. I have another friend. I am very blessed to have the job that I have. I get to meet some incredible people. I get to meet some people that are not that incredible as well, but... Our next speaker does not fall into that second category for sure. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend, Congressman Steve King.
thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, Simon. Thanks, Jennifer Bowen, for pulling this together. I want to thank the governor, the lieutenant governor, our senator, and on down the line. And I want to thank all of you uh, for coming out here today and sending this message. This is a message that goes out all across Iowa, and it's a message that goes across America. When I stand here, I stepped out here this morning, I could feel this. I could feel your hearts. I can feel your thoughts. I can feel your prayers. God will one day answer our prayers, and we will put an end to this abortion holocaust. We'll put an end to it. And I step out here and look up over behind where, where I am right now into that Capitol, and I had the privilege of serving there in the state Senate before I went to Congress. And I remember sitting on the floor of the state Senate when a member of the Senate from the other party stood up, and he said, every child should first be both planned and wanted before they're born. And I will tell you that my stomach flipped over upside down at the very thought that you could think that a, that a baby should be aborted if he wasn't planned or if they're not wanted by the mother, maybe even the father. And I made this case and I'll make this here again. Every baby is both planned and wanted by God. Now, when I saw the Planned Parenthood video, it was a little hard for me to understand that first one, and I read the script, and it soaked into me a little bit. Now, remember, I sit on the Judiciary Committee of the United States Congress. We deal with these issues. When you heard Senator Santorum talk about the legislation to put an end to partial birth abortion, that was also a part of my task in the House side. And it went to the Supreme Court first, and they said, you didn't define that horrible act. Well, they didn't use the word horrible. You didn't define the act precisely enough. And we don't think that you made it clear that there were congressional findings that a partial birth abortion is never necessary to save the life of the mother. So we went back to work, reached into our toolkit, we defined it precisely, and we concluded with congressional finding it was never necessary uh, to do such a thing to save the life of the mother. And finally we went out, as you heard Rick Santorum say. <clears throat> So I've been pretty deep into this, and I've seen some videos and a lot of pictures and listened to a lot of testimony, and I remember an abortionist who found Christ and came and testified to us about the tools he used. And I will tell you that testimony was very moving, and it was, it was ghastly, and it was ghoulish, and it was gruesome, and it was very moving, but it didn't move me like it did when I saw the third of the videos that we've had roll out now from Planned Parenthood. That, when I said what happens in my stomach, I felt my stomach knot up. I felt my heart start to pound in my chest. And what I thought was, this is the feeling I had when I first stepped up to a casket with a loved one in it. That feeling of foreboding, that feeling of dread, that feeling of this is profound and it's life and it's death. That's what I felt when I saw that third video. And so now when I hear people say, we can't defund Planned Parenthood, it's too complex, it may be impossible. I'm talking about some people in leadership in the United States Congress. I say to them, nuts. You know, that's what General McAuliffe said at Bastogne, wasn't it? When the Nazis said surrender, nuts. And by the way, I just think of this in my pocket, maybe I can find it. I have in there a little nut. And... Uh, and I just won't dig it out. You know what an acorn looks like. I carry it in my pocket every day. And, well, not a, that's not a buckeye, but it is, a, it is an acorn. And if you remember what acorn, I brought the first amendment to cut off all funding to acorn probably two years before we saw the videos on what was going on inside of acorn. They were subverting our electoral process. They were promoting prostitution. It goes on and on. But we defunded acorn. And... Because we saw what went on inside. Because we saw the videos from Hannah and James. Because it revolted us as a nation, and it was a movement across the country, and Democrats and Republicans voted to shut off all the funny to Acorn and all their affiliates. And we have held our ground on that ever since. So if anybody tells you it's impossible to defund Planned Parenthood, tell them, quoting General McAuliffe, Nuts, and a particular nut is acorn. That's the model we follow. Now I'll make another point. I said ghastly and ghoulish and gruesome. 
the idea of crushing the lower extremities of a baby and pulling that baby apart and out, but saving the valuable organs and marketing those organs, for this nation to allow that to happen and go on with that after we've seen what's taken place in these videos, think of this. Several years ago, it hit the news that the Chinese would bring capital charges against someone in China that would be, that would be facing the death penalty. They would go through what they call their due process, convict the individual, sentence them to death, and harvest their organs on the way to on the gurney on the way to the on the way to their execution. We thought that was ghastly and ghoulish and gruesome and appalling, and no civilized nation would do such a thing as harvest the organs of someone who is sentenced to death under a due process. And if we had a sanctimonious attitude about China, what do they think of us today? To see what Planned Parenthood is doing and what so far we have tolerated. And what I hear that we can't, and instead I say this, we must, we must cut off all funding to Planned Parenthood. And And you know, I will hold my ground. And I want to give you another little piece of hope here. This is Iowa. We're standing with the Capitol in the background. We set a standard for the nation. We're a first of the nation caucus. We have 17 Republican presidential candidates coming through this state and four or so Democrats coming through this state. You can press every one of them for a public statement on where they stand. And every one of them ought to stand up with us today as Rick Stantorum stood up with us today. And I remind us here in Iowa too, don't think this can't be done here completely. And when the, when the government says you can't cut off funding to Planned Parenthood because it violates a law, what is this, the Obama administration is saying that? They're lecturing us about violating the law or the Constitution? What kind of audacity is coming out of the Obama administration? And when they worry, well, how are we going to argue this in court? Why would Planned Parenthood ever go to court to say, we demand that you pay us because we didn't do anything wrong? They're, the evidence is there. I believe, from what I've seen, they violated federal law. It's against the law to trade in body parts. I believe they violated it. If somebody comes in and robs a bank and they're on your payroll, you don't have to keep them on the payroll until they're convicted, do you? Especially if you've seen the video evidence. And we don't have to pay anybody we choose not to. So here are the states. Here are the states that have already decided to block funding to Planned Parenthood. Arkansas, just recently, Asa Hutchison, edict from the governor. Louisiana, you heard from Bobby Jindal, I think, on that topic. Four years ago, 2011, Scott Walker signed the legislation in Wisconsin. I believe I've heard Rick Perry say this, but I know it's true of Texas. No funding for Planned Parenthood there. Add to that, Alabama. Those folks that are first in the nation primary, New Hampshire, no funding for Planned Parenthood. The Granite Staters, Arizona, Colorado, Indiana, and Ohio. Let's add Iowa and America to that list. Let's get this done. God bless you all. God bless Iowa. God bless America. You know, it's weird. We live in a world right now where uh, in the state of California, they're investigating the messenger. They're investigating the Center for Medical Progress. They are not, however, investigating Planned Parenthood. That's where we live. We have to change it. Today is a start. We've done a rough count. It's rough because, first of all, people are everywhere. We've got three people over there. We've got three people over there. We've got people behind me on both sides. We think there's about a thousand people here on a glorious Iowa Saturday morning. Thank you so much. <laughs> Iowa is important, ladies and gentlemen, but this has to be nationwide. You just heard Congressman King talk about what uh, Scott Walker did in Wisconsin. I'm very pleased to welcome from Wisconsin, Lieutenant Governor Rebecca Cleefish.
Now, you probably don't know me all that well because I am the lieutenant governor in Wisconsin, but I have a feeling that you know my friend because he's also a friend of yours. You probably know Governor Scott Walker. And if you know Scott Walker, you probably know that he's here in Iowa quite a bit these days. Have you noticed that? But what you may not know is that earlier he was here in Iowa because he lived here. Spent some of his formative years in Plainfield where his father, a minister at a Baptist church, taught his young sons about the sanctity of life. See, Scott Walker grew up at the foot of a man of the cloth, teaching his young boys about the fact that our Creator assured that every baby in its mother's womb was created in God's own image. That is what our Governor Scott Walker knows to be true and believes and fights for every single day in Wisconsin. Now, Scott may have spent some of his formative years here in Iowa, and though I did not, my girls, Ella, who is 12, and Violet, who is 9, are spending some of their formative... Oh, you can clap for them, I suppose, or wave to them. Spending some of their formative years here, too, because when we come to Iowa, we come to Washington County in the little itty-bitty town of Westchester, where I go to visit my... <laughs> okay, Westchester, one clap. Very good. Where I come to visit my sister. And if I had my way, I would have brought my sister here to be with me today. However, my sister is nine months pregnant with her fifth baby. The culture of life is alive and well, clearly, in my family. Because if you can say one thing about the pro-life culture, it is that we can spend all day long evangelizing to voters, right? But we are so committed that when we go home to our families, we have a Grow Your Own program. <laughs> and it is that important. It is that important that we spend every day evangelizing and getting new voters, new people to the table to talk about this monumentally important cause. Because here's the thing, in our very foundational document in America, the letter to King George declaring our independence, we said that there were some unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You cannot have the second two unless you have the right to life. And so we as voters, we as citizens, we as moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas and caregivers, we need to fight for that right to life. Are you with me? Yeah. And in Wisconsin, Scott Walker has fought for the right to life and he has won. That's great news. For those who are the most vulnerable, for those who are the most marginalized, for the meekest among us. Because in Wisconsin, we didn't have to wait for the news of Dr. Kermit Gosnell. We didn't have to wait for the gruesome Planned Parenthood videos. We didn't have to wait for the media to rediscover Hillary Clinton saying that she admires Margaret Sanger, who was the founder of Planned Parenthood. We didn't wait for any of it. In fact, in our very first budget, Scott Walker defunded Planned Parenthood. In Wisconsin, Governor Scott Walker signed a bill assuring that any taxpayer funding of abortion was illegal. In fact, there is no health care plan on the exchange that is allowed to cover abortion. You know what else Scott Walker did? Last year at the Right to Life dinner, I met a woman named Sonia. Governor Walker signed Sonia's law last year. 
Sonia was a woman who was facing extraordinary circumstances. She found herself pregnant at a time in her life where she was very worried about ever being able to care for a new baby. She didn't know what her future was going to look like, but she knew that she couldn't live in her past. So when Sonia saw an ultrasound picture of her child, she had an epiphany, a realization that we know that women have when they see an ultrasound image of what they know to be a baby. Sonia made the right choice. Sonia chose life. And Governor Walker has signed legislation to assure that every woman has the same right to knowing what is going on in their body, knowing that there is a baby that we need to protect. And just a couple of weeks ago, Wisconsin became the 15th state in America to assure that no baby in the womb, the baby that we know needs protection, needs our love, will feel pain. Governor Walker signed a 20-week abortion ban in Wisconsin. talk a lot about the fact that he cares deeply about the right to life and most often he does it in the context of his own family. He invokes the names of his two sons just as I talk about Ella and Violet. The governor will talk about his sons Matt and Alex and he talks about the fact that their very first baby pictures were in fact those ultrasound images. And my girls have spent a lot of time with Matt and Alex over the last number of years because if you know anything about Wisconsin, you know that we run for re-election like a hobby there. We, we ran in 2010, and then when we were too conservative and protesters didn't like it, they tried to recall us. So we ran again in 2012. And then, just for good measure, we ran for re-election again 2014 last fall. And so the governor liked this so much, he decided he wasn't going to sit another election out. He decided to run again in 2016. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you that the success story in Wisconsin is a success story that we want to take from coast to coast. And it's a story that means a lot to my family. I say that because I have two little girls up here with me. Ella wants to grow up and be an entrepreneur. Violet wants to grow up, and a couple weeks ago she told me she wanted to be a lawyer. God bless Violet's opponents. And God bless every mother in this crowd, a mom of a strong-willed child. See, Violet, a couple weeks ago, was in the car. We were driving back from gymnastics, and we were playing this family game where we all say what type of superpower we want to have. And me, being the resident stick of the mud in our family, came up with the boring name of Supermom, and I wanted to have the power of flight. I wanted to be able to fly. Violet got way more creative. She said that her superhero name was going to be Viper, and she wanted the power of Veto. And me, the lieutenant governor of Wisconsin, you know, with the constitutional duty of just succession, said, hey, well done, kid. I asked her what she wanted to veto. Violet said, I want to veto vegetables and abortion. See, all of us in this crowd, all of the brave legislative leaders that you have elected in Iowa have a passion for this issue. And our kids do too. Violet learned what abortion was two years ago when she was seven years old and saw an ad on TV. It was a beautiful image, backlit, of a baby in the womb. And the voice was the voice of a little girl. The baby pleading for her life. When we had to tell Violet what the commercial meant, she burst into tears. She grabbed me by both shoulders and she looked me in the eyes and she said, Mom, I've got to give them all my money. Now, some people may laugh at that. But I thought to myself, some people's kids cry over actors and actresses breaking up a relationship. Some people's kids cry over fake vampires or wizards. 
I got a kid who cries over the loss of life of a baby. And you all know what that feels like because you have those kids, you are raising those children too. And so after a moment, I said, Violet, okay, you can give them all your money. And she took her bank shaped like a crayon with all of her Christmas money and her Easter money, her birthday money, everything she had saved up from doing chores. And she went with me to the Right to Life dinner that year. And as I walked up on stage, Violet bounded up behind me with her crayon bank. And I called the leader of our movement up on stage and it was there that Violet gave away all she had, everything that she had earned in her life to save the babies. The Bible tells us in the book of Matthew that if we are to enter the kingdom of heaven, we must become like children. Amen. So let us all today and every day Make a commitment to have the hearts of children when it comes to loving those who need our protection most. Let us all echo the sentiments of people like Scott Walker, your brave legislators and leaders, and all of you in this crowd committed to fight for the right to life. Thank you, Iowa. Well, I'm going to make a prediction that uh, you're going to be hearing the uh, Lieutenant Governor of Wisconsin on my show in the not too distant future. <laughs> Pretty good, right? <laughs> so, uh, so that's going to be fun. Uh, all right, uh, you know, so many people have moved mountains to be here, and I am so, so grateful uh, for everybody who's here. Uh, who's done that. Uh, our next speaker is uh, one such person. We're very pleased to welcome uh, our, newest, uh, our newest congressman, Congressman David Young. Well, everything's, everything's kind of been said, but not everybody said it, right? But uh, I want to share some things on my heart. First of all, it's pretty hot out here, isn't it? But I think Planned Parenthood's feeling a little more heat these days, don't you think? Hey, let's, can everybody put their signs up and wave them? Let's see this C. Oh, that's excellent. God bless you for being here. This is great. Well, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? All right. I want to thank the Iowa Right to Life and Jennifer Bowen. God bless her and her organization and what they do for life. I want to thank Simon Conway for, for being our MC and being part of this and heading this up. This is great. But most of all, I want to thank you. This would be nothing without you and your prayers and support for the unborn. God bless you. I stand with you in supporting life. And I stand with you in support of seeking truth. Now, truth sometimes, it can be ugly, can it? It may not be what we want to see, may not be what we want to hear, but truth matters. Now, we've seen the videos We've heard the voices, and some say, oh, these videos, they've been edited highly, and they're manipulated, and that's not really what happened. Those weren't conversations. Listen, they were not taken out of context, folks. You can view the unedited videos and see for yourself. We are not stupid. We are not. We seek truth, and we are seeing truth. Well, we've seen the footage, and what we see is pretty raw, and it's pretty damning. And who are we as a people? if we allow this to go on? How will we be judged? We are to love God, but we are to fear Him as well. We need to obey the Lord. Now we know there's human trafficking going on in the world. We see it on the television. It happens in our own communities, unfortunately. But could we ever imagine the possibility even that the body parts of the precious unborn will be trafficked for profit? It is purely Orwellian. It is out of some kind of science fiction novel. It's a nightmare. It must stop. It must stop. And this should not be a controversial issue. This should not be something in the, in the muddy middle where you have to really discern and it's black and white, folks. It's wrong to traffic and profit 
on the body parts of the unborn. We have to stop that. And we, we the people, our taxpayers, we should not be underwriting this egregious, nefarious, evil behavior by Planned Parenthood or anyone else. Now, I gave some thanks out to some folks here in the beginning, but I want to thank our founding fathers for the First Amendment. Our faith means so much to us and our ability to practice it, freedom of speech, press, the right to assemble here today, and let's not forget about that other one, the right for you, the citizens, to petition your government and seek change and stop this. God bless you. God bless you, and God bless those who do not have a voice. You know, I want to thank my counterpart who is here today, Steve King. He's a friend of mine. I want to thank Senator Grassley and Joni Ernst. Joni was here today and her words and what they're doing over in the U.S. Senate, and I pledge to work hard in the House to do the same. Now, I was sifting through a cigar box the other night, not for cigars, but for some old family photos, and I came across a picture of my grandfather in the late 70s, down here at the base of the Capitol at a pro-life rally supporting the unborn. Now sometimes it takes time. It may take generations to win these battles, but ultimately we will win the war. God bless you. God bless the power of the people here and the power of prayer. God bless you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Congressman David Young, ladies and gentlemen. All right, uh, it's interesting, you know, uh, Planned Parenthood, uh, they came here this morning, they were very early. They parked like half a dozen cars over there, decorated them, then they ran away and got on the bus to the fair. So when you watch the media tonight, if you see counter demonstration, you know the lie that that is. Every uh, agency in our state has to be involved in this fight. Every agency. Because you see, there's a whole bunch of uh, Iowa voters. We hear about disenfranchising voters because we actually want to know who you are. So weird. <sighs> Think of the disenfranchised who never got the opportunity to be born. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, our Secretary of State, Mr. Paul Pate. Thank you very much. Go down here. Thank you. Well, we all know that life is our most precious resource and it should be protected. As a father of three children, I'm kind of biased. I think they're pretty cute and pretty talented. And a grandfather of five and many more to come, I hope. I can tell you there's no greater feeling than holding that brand new life in your hands for the first time and literally in your hand. We all know that. It's kind of like preaching to the choir here today. And we couldn't think of a better back setting than the state capitol right behind us, your Iowa state seat of government, and making sure that your voice is heard. And I thank you for coming out and doing just that. But for your voice to really be heard, for everyone's voice here to be heard, you must register to vote, and you've got to make sure you go out and vote, and we need to tell our friends, and we need to tell our neighbors, and we need to tell our fellow supporters, and we have to make sure our voice is out there, and that's how you do that. Because if it's not you, who will it be that's going to carry this message out? And you do it at the ballot box. You do it at the ballot box. And this is a great way to send a message with the state fair going on, with the presidential candidates coming into our great state. But we know in Iowa, being the first in the nation for caucuses, we have a responsibility to share with the state, not only the state, but the country, those priorities Americans share. And life is one of the very first and the most important ones that we share. And this rally is a great way to get it started. <laughs> support your friends, support the people who are carrying the message, 
And for those who are still lost in the wilderness and don't understand how we need to preserve life, we continue to try to educate them. We continue to try to show them the right path. And that's what we can do today. And I hope that it doesn't take us 10 years or 20 years to get that done. I hope that we can get this done very soon. Soon, sooner the better. Thank you again for inviting me. Our Secretary of State, Mr. Paul Pate. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, just, uh, just give me 45 seconds of your time right now before I bring on our next speaker. And it's relevant. The timing of what I want to say to you is very relevant. And the thought was put into my head by Representative Walt Rogers. In the last legislative session, which took place right behind us, right now, they moved mountains to get a gas tax passed in our state. Mountains. The previous speaker ripped apart a committee, put himself on it for one day to get the result that he wanted. Why am I bringing this up? If we can do that for a flipping gas tax, we better be able to do that for the unborn. With that, ladies and gentlemen, the current majority leader and probable next speaker of the Iowa House, Linda Upmeyer. Thank you, Simon. It is so great to see so many here turned out on this really warm day, but wonderful day, all to defend life. So thank you so much for being here. We're all here together to do one thing, and that is to support life. Thank you. Thank you for that. The sanctity of human life, no matter what stage of development. These undercover videos of Planned Parenthood, like you, absolutely break my heart. They remind us, and they show everyone else, how twisted a society can become if it doesn't value life. <laughs> Simon was absolutely right. We need to do some things in the Iowa House, but let me tell you what the Iowa House did this year. And I want to refer to Lieutenant Governor Cleefish's comments, too, because I am proud to tell you that each and every one of the things that Scott Walker had the great joy to sign into law, we have sent to the Senate. And guess what happened in the Senate? In the Iowa House, we do work hard every year to protect the lives of the unborn. This session, the state of Iowa made great strides in protecting life while also keeping women's health in mind. We passed legislation that ensures that any woman seeking an abortion in Iowa will have an ultrasound, will be given the chance to see the life growing inside her and will be consulted about all the alternatives to ending that life. But we had to fight tooth and nail to get this done because sadly, there are some in this state who don't want women making informed decisions. They don't want women to see the miracle of life. Instead, they want to talk with detachment and disregard as we've seen in these undercover videos. Last spring, before the videos, and with little or no fanfare, the Iowa House defunded Planned Parenthood. We passed a budget that rejected federal dollars and the strings that come attached with that so that we could fund those things we wanted to do to care for women in the way that we want to do it in this state. While we have a strong majority in the House that was willing and ready to do this, sadly, we were not successful because of the leadership in the Senate. But these undercover videos have changed the conversation, haven't they? They've confronted us with a very ugly truth 
that is energizing Iowans to stand up and change this law. I believe those videos have clearly breathed fresh life into our efforts and we can put pressure on the Senate like they have never seen before, right? And if they aren't willing to defund Planned Parenthood next session, I hope every single one of you will work with me to make sure that we flip that Senate into a chamber that will work with us on these issues. It's so amazing to see you all here today. Thank you so much for coming. I love the energy, I love the passion, and I just want to thank you for coming together, honoring the miracle of life and God's blessing. Thank you. The probable next speaker of the Iowa House, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Linda Rottmeyer. Uh, okay, every single presidential candidate of both parties was invited here today, including Hillary Clinton. We did get a response from Hillary Clinton. Her schedule was uh, just, couldn't happen. Ah. But at least we got a response. We didn't get a response from any of the other Democrats, so uh, that's, I guess, a point in the maybe box for her. Uh, somebody who really, really wanted to be here is somebody I've got to know very, very well over the past few years. He simply could not make it happen. He is, however, back in the state next week with a big rally. Speaking for him is uh, the former Secretary of State of the State of Iowa, Matt Schultz, speaking for U.S. Senator and Presidential Candidate Ted Cruz. Well, what an awesome crowd, and what a great day. And I'll tell you, I, it's an honor for me to send the greetings to you of my great friend, Senator Ted Cruz. I love Ted Cruz because he's honest, and he stands up for what he believes in, what we believe in. And I gotta be honest with you, I'm sick and tired of politicians who stand up and say they're pro-life, but when they go to Washington, they don't stand up for us. You know, Sarah Cruz talks about the Washington cartel, a group of people who just want to protect their power. And I always ask myself, why do Republicans, why do conservatives go to Washington and then get weak and back down? Well, it's because of the media, right? They're scared of the media. Well, let's be honest. The media is never, ever going to support our cause. They care more about the life of Cecil the Lion than they do about the unborn. When we have control of the Congress, there's absolutely no reason why Planned Parenthood should receive one taxpayer dime. We need leaders who are going to stand up and fight. How many of you want a leader who's gonna defund Planned Parenthood? How many of you want a leader who's going to go in and prosecute criminally those who have violated federal law in these disgusting videos that we've seen? How many of you want a leader who's going to stand up for the unborn and the rights of life? If you want that leader, then I'm asking you to stand with me and other courageous conservatives in standing with Senator Ted Cruz. He will fight and defund Planned Parenthood. He will prosecute these criminals. And he didn't just say it, he said it right away. This has to be done. He will fight for life. We need leaders who will fight for life who aren't worried about the media. You know, our Savior Jesus Christ didn't worry about what the Pharisees and Sadducees said. 
He went to the temple and threw out the money changers. It's time for us to go to Washington and throw those people out who will not fight for us and fight for life. Thank you, God bless you. Quite funny, though. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, great things have been predicted for our next speaker. Some people say at some point in his uh, career he's going to hate me, and I don't care. Because we tell the truth, right? So a lot of people uh, think that uh, one day down the road our next speaker may well be uh, one of our governors. Uh, we could do a lot worse, trust me. <laughs> That's not an endorsement. Um, but uh, he is here today uh, not to speak for himself. He's here today to speak for another presidential candidate, uh, somebody I know extremely well, Senator Marco Rubio. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, State Senator Jack Whitver. Well, thank you so much uh, for being here and allowing me to speak on behalf of Senator Rubio today. And thank you so much for all that you all do to protect life in the state of Iowa. I can tell you as a state legislator, your prayers and your support are very much appreciated and very much needed as we do our work here down at the Capitol. As we um, move on through this campaign, um, about three months ago I decided to take a position as the state chair for Senator Rubio. And briefly today I'd just like to talk about two things going on in this campaign. First of all I want to talk about why, why I support Senator Rubio. And second of all, I want to talk about some of his long-held and deeply held positions on protecting life in his career. I signed on as his state chair for several reasons, but I just want to share a couple, if I may, here today. First of all, he's a great man. He is a great man. I've got to know him as a genuine person, honest and trustworthy, and most important to me, as a father of three young kids myself, he's a great family man. Every chance he gets, he's talking about his kids, he's with his kids. I'm proud that his kids will be on the campaign trail with us soon in Iowa. He's a great man, and it's important that we put a great man in the White House, a great, solid man. Second of all, second of all, he has a vision for the future of the country. You know, someone once said, small minds talk about people, average minds talk about events, and great minds talk about ideas. There is nobody on the trail right now talking about a bigger, bolder vision for the future of this country to create a new American century than Marco Rubio. And I'm proud to be a part of a campaign that doesn't get in the battles between each other. We're talking about the future of this country. Third of all, number three, he's a great conservative. And there are certainly other great conservatives in this race. There's no doubt about it. But he is one of them. He has a long record from his time in the Florida House to Speaker of the Florida House to the U.S. Senate and now on the campaign trail of being a great conservative. 100% ranking with Americans for Prosperity. A 100% ranking with National Right to Life. He is a great conservative. But beyond that, we can't just have someone that has a good record. We need someone that can communicate our values to the nation if we're ever going to accomplish anything. If we're ever going to win another national election, we need someone that can communicate our values. I honestly believe that the American people are on our side. We have just not done a good enough job communicating our principles over the last few elections. Once we get in office, once we win the White House, if we are ever going to accomplish our goals, our ideas, our vision for the future, we need someone that can sell it not only to Congress, but to the entire nation. There is no doubt that Marco Rubio can do that. He is the most articulate messenger in the conserva conservative movement today in America. And then finally, finally, he can win. He can win this election. If you look at all the swing states, the states that are going to decide this, he can win. He is leading Hillary Clinton in all those. And I cannot wait for a matchup between a leader from yesterday with ideas from yesterday versus a young, fresh-faced leader with new ideas for a new American century. We will win that race all day. I guarantee it. Now, now did anyone see the debate last week? I'm hoping all of you saw it. I want to talk briefly about what happened in that debate. The moderators asked Marco a question. I think it was they were trying to play got you with him on life. They were trying to trip him up and get him to say something he didn't want to say. And he looked that moderator in the eye, 
He looked 24 million people in the eye through the camera, and he did not flinch when saying, life begins at, at conception. There's no doubt about it. And I want to read a quote. I want to read a quote from Marco in that debate, speaking to 24 million Americans about life. He said, quote, we need to pass a law in this country that says all human life at every stage of development is worthy of protection. In fact, I think that law already exists. It's called the Constitution of the United States. He went on to say, he went on to say, I believe every single human being is entitled to the protection of our laws, whether they can vote or not, whether they can speak or not, whether they can hire a lawyer or not, whether they have a birth certificate or not. And I think future generations will look back on the history of this country and call us barbarians for million, murdering millions of babies who we never gave a chance to live. You know, our Declaration of Independence promises us three things. They promise life, they promise liberty, and they promise the pursuit of happiness. But without life, there is no liberty and there is no happiness. That's why this fight is so important. And I want to and I want to thank Joni if she's still here, Senator Ernst if she's still here. Thank you for your leading the charge in Washington. Marco was very happy to, and proud to support you in defunding Planned Parenthood. In closing here, thank you, Joni. In closing here, I just want to say I'm proud to support a pro-life candidate, and we need someone in the White House that stands for us. And there is no doubt, Marco made it clear in that debate, he stands with us. In closing. A lot of people have said Marco Rubio is the future of the Republican Party. They've been saying it for six years. I agree with them. That future is now. Please join us on this campaign. Thank you and God bless. I just want to share a little something with you uh, for a moment just before we bring up uh, our next uh, speaker. You see, in addition to this going on today, there's an opening today. What is it? Well, I can tell you that uh, over in Creston, Iowa, after a 40 Days for Life campaign, Planned Parenthood closed its doors. Although that is wonderful, that is in fact not the best bit. Today is the grand opening of the Life Care Clinic in Creston, Iowa, in that building. We can move mountains, ladies and gentlemen. We really can. Uh, we wanted uh, somebody to represent uh, the uh, Iowa House. That was the majority leader. We wanted somebody to represent the uh, Iowa State uh, Senate. That is Senator Ken Rosenboom, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Simon. And thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, Linda Upmeyer mentioned uh, stuff that dies at the door of the Senate. There's nothing you can do more than help uh, Jack Whitfer and me gain the Iowa Senate in 2016 so we can get some good work done. I'm going to take a little different approach to uh, this topic today. Many times the topic of abortion is talked is discussed in abstract clinical or political terms. But the reality is that every time a decision is made on abortion, there are intensely personal and emotional components. So I want to tell you the story of Dustin Jake. Dustin was conceived in, in uh, late 1986 in Rochester, Minnesota, by his mother, Christy, and a father who denied any responsibility. Christy's circumstances were difficult. She was 15 years old drinking heavily, using every drug she could get her hands on. She was pregnant with no husband and had been kicked out of her house. In the judgment of Eddie, the best option would have been to terminate the pregnancy, and she may well have been advised to do that. But Christy found another path. She found her way from Rochester to a place called the Lighthouse in Kansas City. The Lighthouse is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to provide a home, prenatal care, work training, counseling, and delivery services to young, scared girls like Christy. 
about half the children at the light, born at the lighthouse go home with their mother, and the other half are put up for adoption. None are aborted. After Justin Jake was born in August of 1987, Christy went back home to Rochester with her new baby. She cared for Dustin for three months, and she decided she could not raise this child on her own. She was only 16. So she went back to the lighthouse for about a month, where they counseled her in the agonizing process of giving Dustin Jake up for adoption. She chose an adoptive family and returned to her home. The adopting parents were delighted to, with their baby son. Finally, having a second child, they so desperately wanted to complete their family. They named him Matthew Eli. Matt, like his big sister, was a delightful baby. Unlike his big sister, Matt was a difficult child to raise. He was not troublesome, but he really didn't like school very much. Every day for school, to get him to school was a, was, a, uh, was a battle for both his mother and father. He got passing grades, but it was a struggle for him, and even more so for his parents. All Matt ever wanted to do was join the U.S. Army. His mother didn't like that idea very much, but his father said, well, if you're going to be a soldier, be a good soldier. He joined the Army in 2008, and after basic training in AIT, he graduated from jump school in Fort Benning, Georgia. At last, Matt was a trained Army paratrooper. Matt spent six years in the Army, mostly in Alaska, with two tours of duty in Afghanistan. He now works on the north slope of Alaska because he fell in love with the state when he was stationed there. As some of you in this crowd know, my wife and I have another name for Matt. We call him our son. And the reason I'm telling you this story is really quite simple. Matt is an able-bodied, tax-paying citizen that proudly served his country because the lighthouse in Kansas City provided a better alternative for Christie's difficult situations. They provided a home for a young, scared, addicted, pregnant teenage girl. They took care of her prenatal needs, her delivery, her emotional needs, and her baby. Then they identified a family that could raise her son. Two years ago, Matt and his wife, Whitney, began their search to find Christy, Matt's birth mother. One Tuesday night in February of 2013, my wife called me here in Des Moines to tell me to look at an email. There, for the first time, I saw the face of Christy. On the following day, Wednesday, Whitney called me to tell me she had talked to Christy over the phone. On Thursday, Valentine's Day, Matt called his birth mother. And when she answered the phone, instead of hearing the silent, haunting voice of an unborn baby that she might have terminated 25 years earlier, she heard the strong voice of her firstborn son. Then Matt called his adoptive mother and thanked her and me for adopting him. I hope you take two lessons from my brief history of Dustin Jake. First, the next time an abortion advocate tries to tell you that difficult circumstances justify the death sentence for an unborn baby, I want you to tell them the story of Dustin Jake or tell them and come talk to me. Number two, the value of the unborn baby is not expressed in the sum of body parts. It is expressed in life itself. Thank you. Uh, by the way, um, uh, all day today, uh, we've had state troopers uh, here watching our backs and uh, they're standing there still in their uniforms. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. We appreciate it. We really do.
Uh, our next uh, speaker, uh, I really, I, I've known him really since I've been here in Iowa, but I got to know him real well about a year ago because uh, there was a trip that went out to Israel. Senator Rick Santorum organized that. I had the honor of being invited. I think it's because there were a whole bunch of Christians and uh, they were going to Israel, so they needed a Jew, right? I mean, I had to go. <laughs> so, uh, so I went with and uh, they stayed for 48 hours. I stayed all week and broadcast my show from Jerusalem, which was very interesting while the rockets were flying. Ladies and gentlemen, from the family leader, someone I get to call friend now, travel buddy, Mr. Bob Van Platz. Thank you, Simon, and thank you, everybody, for coming out today. It's a blessing to see everybody. My devotions today was out of 1 John 3, verse 18. And I thought, how appropriate for today. Because 1 John 3, 18 says, Let us not love with words and speech, but let us love with action and truth. It's time for action and truth and done with speeches to protect the unborn. You know, this year I feel a bit like an international traveler. I got to go to Israel with Simon and then again this past winter, but I also got a chance to go to Poland, in Krakow, Poland. And while in Krakow, Poland, we had the opportunity to visit Auschwitz and Birkenau. And they, they, they wanted to impress on me that this was the educated that did this. The Holocaust was done at, by the hands of the educated, the political elite, the doctors, the scientists. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? And on the state capitol grounds, and yes, behind me is the capitol, but behind you is a memorial to the Holocaust victims that, that's, that, that went through that. And one day, my guess is, we're going to have a memorial in honor of the 60 million babies that were terminated in this country. So ladies and gentlemen, I encourage you to be encouraged when you leave here today and to be united as you leave here today for the sanctity of human life. But we live in extraordinary times. And those extraordinary times demand, not suggest, but they demand extraordinary leadership. And when we have extraordinary leadership, we will defund Planned Parenthood no matter what the cost, no matter what the complexities, no matter what the legislations, we will stand up and we will defund them. So we have a couple of practical steps. First of all, we applaud U.S. Senator Joni Ernst for calling the U.S. Senate out and saying, let's have a vote to defund Planned Parenthood. That, was, that didn't go. That was a show vote. Now put Planned Parenthood on an appropriations bill and send it to Obama's desk to shut Planned Parenthood down. And if we can't shut Planned Parenthood down through an appropriations bill, put it on a continuing resolution bill and shut the government down if we can't shut Planned Parenthood down. And we need to encourage and we need to unite around Governor Brandstad to fall in line with all of these other governors. Follow the example of Governor Bobby Jindal. Defund Planned Parenthood immediately. And not only defund them, but launch a full out investigation of the practices of defund Planned Parenthood in Iowa. And when we find out that their hands are as guilty as the peers around the country, then prosecute them to the fullest extent of the law. These past few days, these past few days, we've gotten to see the videos. You see, Planned Parenthood makes all of its money being out on stage about what they do for women's health. It's not about women's health. It's about killing babies, manipulating the practice so they can harvest the body parts and sell them over salad and a glass of wine. 
If we can't defund that, shame on us. Defund it and defund it now. So we at the family were thrilled to stand with Simon Conway and all the other like-minded organizations. Let's stand and unite around action and around truth and live out Joshua 9. Let us have a spirit of boldness and of courage because God is with us. Defund Planned Parenthood. Thank you so much. You know, uh, at a lot of these events, it's very interesting what happens. The crowd thins as it goes on. Nobody's left here. We've had people fled, flee to the trees, and I don't blame them on both sides. And we've had people that really stood in the heat. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, Bob mentioned uh, the Holocaust Memorial behind you. I have a very small family. And the reason I have a very small family is a lot of my family was lost to the Holocaust. And what the uh, Nazis managed to do to get the population compliant is they dehumanized Jews. They weren't real people. Now we're being told, it's a bunch of cells. It doesn't mean anything. That's not a real human being. We have doctors, doctors who deal in this carnage. It has to stop, ladies and gentlemen. We have to defund Planned Parenthood and shut it down. People have come here today from far and wide. We have a busload of people unloaded and uh, smaller buses as well. We have one couple who I told you about who drove 15 hours to be here today. The power of the internet, ladies and gentlemen. Our next uh, speaker is also somebody I traveled to, uh, to Israel with and got to know very well on that journey. Stood next to him, actually uh, held his arm, I don't even know if he remembers, as he gazed down for the very first time in his life on the Garden of Gethsemane. Tears rolling down his face. This is an honorable, honorable man. He's driven all the way from uh, the Sioux City area to be with us today. My friend, Reverend Carrie Gordon. It's a privilege to be here with you today. I bring something a little bit different to the discussion. I want to thank Simon for doing this. Give him a hand. Now I'm sandwiched right in the cleanup crews. My job is to clean up. So I'm going to say a few things too and to share something with you that I just found in the Bible a couple of weeks ago that I thought was very interesting. I think it's poignant for today to talk about it. And then I'm going to invite everybody to pray with me because I believe in the power of prayer. And I also believe in the power of acting after we pray. The Bible says faith without works is dead. You can't get any worse than dead. So if God believes faith without works is dead, what must he think of prayer without actions to follow? So it's important that we do both. We have to pray and we have to act. Yeah. One of the things that we have to do is tell the truth about what's going on concerning abortion in this country. And realize that until the day that abortion is outlawed completely, we will continue to fight this battle of this gruesome stuff. And the things that we've seen in these videos is just the tip of the iceberg. Imagine what you haven't seen and what you don't know yet. And what must God think as he looks down on our country? How long do we think God will just stand there and do nothing? He is doing something. And some of what he's doing, the happy part of it is you. Standing here today in the heat together. The power of synergy. Unity. Love for God. Love for country. I was reading in the Bible a couple of days ago, actually. I just did a minister's conference. Pastors came around from the United States. And you know how you read through the Bible and you come across something. You've read the passage before. You know it maybe a thousand times, but something hits you. And you never noticed before. And I, 
I found the story of King Josiah. And King Josiah, of course, the Bible says, is the greatest king. There's never been one like him before or after, next to Jesus. And Josiah's story is amazing because Israel had degraded itself and become worse, the Bible says, than the nations God raised them up to punish. They were gruesome and brutal. They had set up Baal worship, a great big idol. Some of the archaeologists and some of the theologians have sketched their concepts of Baal, and Baal was about a 30-foot statue of this monstrous looking thing leaning forward with two hands and a big iron bowl in his hands. And they built a fire beneath the bowl. And the flames would come up, the temperatures reaching well past 2,000 degrees. And in Baal worship, they would take their infants and set them on the searing hot bowl and the children would be burnt to death. But it created a problem for the government of King Manasseh. Manasseh was the great-grandfather of Josiah. And I look at my own country, I look at the condition that we're in right now, and I find myself asking the same question I know good and well many of you are asking, is it even possible for us to ever turn this mess around? Yes. It is. And I'm sure Josiah thought the same thing after the mess that his family had created, but his great-grandfather Manasseh had done evil beyond evil. The Bible says King Manasseh took his own children and put them on the searing hot bowl in the arms of Baal. And they would bring all of the citizens to watch, but they had a problem. The civil government had a problem under the administration of Manasseh. The children would scream so loudly, the most horrid screams of terror, that it began to disturb the population about the direction of their nation. So they came up with a plan. Manasseh ordered that they build great, big, huge bass drums. Drums so loud that it would drown out the sounds of the screams of the children. And as they walked up in their processional to put the baby on the hot searing bowl of the idol bale with the flames coming up from beneath, they'd begin to bang those drums as loud as they could as a distraction to keep the people of Israel from hearing the horrors and recognizing the evil that they were doing. I didn't know any of that because I went to the book of Chronicles and I found Josiah two generations later. And it says that King Josiah discovered the Bible. He had to discover it hidden in the caves because his great-grandfather Manasseh had launched an all-out attack on the authority of the Mosaic Law, the Old Testament. And he burned everything that he could find. They literally threw the Bible out of their government and burned it so that no one could ever hopefully read it again. Well, some daring priest had hid a few scrolls of our Old Testament in a cave. And for two generations, they protected it until they saw a king that had a conscience. And so they pretended, really, a lot of theologians say, they pretended that they, oh, look, we tripped over this in a cave, king. Look at what it says. Josiah read the laws of Moses and began to weep. It says he tore his clothes. He was grieved to discover how wicked they had become. And an incredible revival broke out in Israel, and it never should have happened. If you know how bad Manasseh was, and how amazing Josiah became. You would look at it and say it's not possible. And I think it's important to go back to the Bible. That's where we get our faith and our hope. And I can still look at America right now and I still believe it's possible to turn this around. But the passage I stumbled over and I didn't understand, I just basically stole my own thunder with you. Now you'll get it. But I didn't know about the drums. I didn't know they were using loud banging noises to dampen the sounds of the horrors of their civilization. And bringing in music, we call it bread and circuses sometimes. Things to distract the public attention from the severity of the evil going on under their watch. So I see Josiah do something later in the text and it shocked me. I thought, what is he doing? Because I didn't know anything about the drums. I didn't know about the music. I didn't realize what his great-grandfather had done. I read this passage. Josiah is killing wicked people, punishing the criminals, and he comes across drums. And the Bible says that he took the drums and he burned them, and he took the ashes of the drums and threw it over the graves of the previous generations as a sign against them. And then he deliberately went 
to the religious leaders two generations ago who had died and took their bones out of their graves to desecrate them as a sign against them for participating in the evil and threw them on an altar to make a point in two directions. And I want to tell you something. We have a previous generation that failed. We have previous administration after administration that has failed. Here's what defunding Planned Parenthood is not. And you need to get into the truth and get down to the depths of this because you're hearing a lot of things that aren't necessarily so, even today from this microphone. Defunding Planned Parenthood is not quietly going to Planned Parenthood and say, look, we're going to keep giving you the money we've been giving you for years, but you need to get a segregated bank account. We're going to keep giving it to you. Put it in the other account and promise you won't buy anything sharp. That's not defunding Planned Parenthood. And then to say none of your tax dollars are going to anything that has to do with abortion, that's not true. The day that they are still paying their light bill with my money is a day that I have not been treated right by this building right back here. I don't want my tax money paying their light bill, their mortgage, their salary, for them to buy a nice bow tie or a Lamborghini. I don't want one cent of my money going to that butcher house. It's time to stop the nonsense and quit lying to the people of Iowa and get rid of these. I tell you what, it's a good first step. Let's defund them, take away their taxpayer money, but let's put them out of business. Let's prosecute them and put the right people in jail where they belong. Now, I can't lean on people to do that, but I can lean on God to hear my prayer. I'm going to invite you to pray with me and even the peanut gallery back here. Pray with me. If you can hear me way back there, pray with me. Father God, we come before you in front of the capital, the great state of Iowa, and we are sad and we are ashamed. And I say I'm sorry to you for any moments in the past when I haven't been loud enough or clear enough on this issue to my own representatives. To the times when I've slapped somebody on the back and I should have been yelling at them and telling them to repent. I ask, Lord, that you forgive us and make us right. Give us the sense to pay attention, to know when we're being deceived. Give us the courage to tell our representatives to do their job and stop representing Des Moines to us and represent us to Des Moines. Anoint our churches and be with our pastors and give us the courage and the boldness to be real men of God in dark times. I pray, Lord, for every person that's here, every campaign that's represented, that you would deal with all of us in our own hearts in different ways that we need to get right with you. Ways we need to say we're sorry. We need to improve. We need to change our attitude. We need to read a little bit more of the Bible and a little bit less of the news. Help us to get right as the people of Iowa, to elect good, honorable people that meet the qualifications of Scripture and to stop worrying about popularity and people thinking we're great. Forgive us, Lord, and forgive our nation and have mercy on us like you did in the days of Josiah. Raise up a Josiah here in our generation that will honor the laws of Moses. Specifically, thou shalt not murder. And be with us, Lord, and help us leave a better nation to our children and our grandchildren than what was handed to us. I pray it in the mighty name of Jesus. And the people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Keep fighting. Never left with any doubt about uh, what the Reverend Carrie Gordon thinks, are we? You know, uh, having my job, I get to meet people. I've told you that before. Some of them are great. Some of them are not so great. A lot of politicians here today did it genuinely change their schedules. They gave their speeches. They left. Some of them I don't know about their schedules. What I do know is that for more, well over an hour and 15 minutes after he spoke, Congressman Steve King was still hanging out here. It says a lot. It matters who we elect. Say it with me. It matters who we elect. Somebody we did not elect is my very, very close friend now, who I met through this process. A man I've toured the state of Iowa with 
for town hall meeting seven we've done so far ladies and gentlemen colonel sam clovis To quote my uh, friend, Pastor Gordon, thank God I'm near the end, so. <laughs> I wanna spend a little bit of time with you today and give you a little bit different perspective, particularly as we come to the close of this rally. We've heard great speakers, courageous men and women who believe in life and defending life and who have done that one more thing to do that. I'm reminded of the speeches that I heard today about the fact somebody talked about their son being in jump school. Well, I went to jump school in 1968. That's a hard to believe it was that long ago, and I was quite literally half the man I am today. <laughs> I wore my special Ray-Ban aviator sunglasses today because I have firmly believed as a fighter pilot that when you wear glasses like this and you go real fast, you get smaller. <laughs> I haven't been able to go very fast for a long time, so I'm depending totally on the glasses to have that effect today. I wanna to talk to you about what I chose to do in my life as a profession. I told my buddy Scott Shaben over here, I said, this speech is gonna to be totally about me. And I want you to indulge me a few minutes. When I was 17 years old, I had the opportunity to go to the United States Air Force Academy. 17, 1,050 of us entered that class. 692 graduated four years later. Along the way, I've lost a lot of dear friends to combat, to accidents, to nature, to all of those things. We have all done our part to raise our families to be good citizens, but what we were beginning in that wonderful June day in 1967 and what we all are still today are warriors. We chose the warrior creed. We chose to become warriors to defend an idea, to defend the idea of the Constitution of the United States. We do not swear an oath to the Congress. We don't swear an oath to the President. We don't even swear an oath to you. We swear an oath to an idea, a concept, something captured that captures the notion of all those things that we talked about in the Declaration of Independence, the why of America, the Constitution gives us the what of America, and that means the protection first, last, and always the protection of life. I am a warrior. I have had to stand alone. It has never bothered me one bit to be the only person standing when I knew that in my heart I was doing what God had wanted me to do because I alone, with God's help like Gideon, can stand against anything and can vanquish all. I want to ask you now to please Internalize this to yourselves. I want you to become warriors. That means you will do whatever it takes to end this incredible, savage butchery that we see presented in Planned Parenthood and any other operation in America that leads to the fact that an unborn life is taken. You are the warriors. When I campaigned across this state, I had the, the finishing thing, and every campaign stop in the, in the last several months when I was running for the state treasurer, I was always the person that finished the all of the speeches. I was the one because I would always ask you, 
what you were willing to do. What are you willing to do? Are you willing to stand against abortion? Are you willing to stand against Planned Parenthood? Are you willing to stand against the legislators that lie to you and let you down? Are you willing to do that one more thing? Are you willing to stand as warriors with God's hand on your shoulder and lead the fight to end abortion and end the savage killing of our unborn in this nation? Are you willing to stand with me, a warrior? Thank you very much. Man, I am so blessed. That man's my friend. I am so blessed. Ladies and gentlemen, there are a whole bunch of people here. We had, uh, when, we're, when we're done, there will have been 20 speakers. We are almost there at the end. So there are people here who uh, uh, wanted to be here and, but have not been uh, able to talk to you today. Uh, National, Republican National Committee man Steve Scheffler is here. Republican National Committee woman uh, Tamara Scott is here. State Senator Brad Zorn is here. Representative, Representative Kev Costa is here. Senator Guth is here. Representative Walt Rogers was here. Representative Dawn Pettengill, Dean Fisher, and Ted Gassman all showed up today. Some of them drove a long way. Thank you very much. We have three things left to do. The last one is me. So two and a bit. First of all, I have another friend here today. He is the uh, state director in our state for uh, Ben Carson campaign. Mr. Ryan Rhodes. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming out. Ben couldn't be here today, but he really, really wanted to. Um, I've had the real pleasure of getting to know this man over the course of the last uh, few months as this started and hearing him talk and watching even behind the scenes as these videos came out and seeing just how much it actually personally devastated him because as a doctor one of the things he did was he actually went in the womb and saved a life they actually told him do not do it it's unethical you can't do it you can't do that it would be better to abort these babies and he said no 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 he stood up and actually went back and went into the womb and there is not another politician who can say that they actually went out there and saved the life and advanced a procedure that actually continues to save lives to these days. So when Ben Carson says it, it's not a talking point, it's his life. So hearing that type of stuff every day, seeing, getting to see the, those things and, and the fact is he has had, he has stood over and over and over when the Planned Parenthood videos came out, but before that even. And he's explained the just horrors that it is, that it goes so much beyond just uh, abortion and that, that they're actually going out and targeting people. Because he understands, that you, we hear a lot about talk about Black Lives Matter right now, okay? But Ben actually said, look at this, this lady went out, Margaret Sanger went out and targeted black communities purposely. So it is near and dear to his heart to go to that community and bring them out of that because he understands that they are going and preying on people who sometimes are hurting, who sometimes do not have the same money to be able to get out there and they're scared and they're being preyed on by doctors who are going and saying, oh, don't, don't worry. This is just a simple th procedure. It's like pulling a tooth. And I know that that's similar to how they ask them because I actually had a family member that went in and thought about it. And she said to me, Ryan, what do I tell my little child? Because they made it sound like it was just pulling a tooth, and now I have the most beautiful baby girl. And if we do not understand that that kind of life is precious, and what we're being, is being stolen from us in the, in the, in the next generation is, being, is literally being stolen and killed off, then we're not going to save it. We don't need a leader who goes out there and says, I'm just going to advance le legislation. We need somebody who is going to change the conscience of a nation. Because like it or not, the president does create a conscience of the nation. 
Look what we've had now. He has created a culture of death. Barack Obama has consistently created a culture of death and a culture of inimality. And it's about time that we put a president in there who looks to God every single day and says, how do I change this? We won't change it with one piece of legislation, but we will change it with a president who not just uses heal, inspire, revive as a talking point, but has lived it in his life. Thank you guys, and I appreciate uh, you being here. Dr. Carson sends his love, and if you want to see him at the State Fair, talk to him then. He'll be there tomorrow at 4 p.m. at the Soapbox. Take care, guys. It was a Thursday afternoon. It was uh, not even, was it two weeks ago? I don't even think it was two weeks ago. Maybe it was two weeks ago. That, uh, well, I played some audio on the air from one of these videos from uh, the undercover videos from Planned Parenthood. And I, I finished playing the audio and I said, you know what, we need to come together. We need to put an awful lot of people on the grounds of the state capitol and we need to have a rally because we need to say that the butchery of our children is not American. I get to flap my gums for uh, three hours a day. Well, actually, five hours a day now. But what I did is, as soon as uh, we went to the next commercial break, I contacted a friend of mine because I knew I couldn't do this on my own. The very next day, we met. By that afternoon, we had permission to be here on these grounds today. We invited an awful lot of people, but I promise you this would not have come together without the incredible hard work of my good friend, the executive director, I believe I'm terrible with the uh, titles, but if, I, if not, my apologies, uh, Jennifer Bowen, ladies and gentlemen. Good, good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here today. Wow. If you build it, they will come. Haven't we heard that somewhere? Today is the day, as Simon has said, and every speaker before me has said, 19 speakers in a week and a half that could not have happened without the leadership and the vision of our friend Simon Conway. So please thank him. All right, so let me hear from you today. Have you heard enough? Is enough enough yet? Have you had enough? Are you ready to see Planned Parenthood fully defunded and criminal investigations launched in every single one of their 700 plus locations? 15 of those locations are located here in Iowa alone. This morning, I guess it's a little afternoon now, this afternoon I have many people here that I'd like to thank on your behalf. Thank you to Governor Branstead for his leadership in launching the audit process here in Iowa. Thank you to Lieutenant Governor Reynolds for agreeing to vigilantly watch over that audit process. Thank you to Senator Charles Grassley, who could not be here today because in true form, he's in the middle of his full Grassley, and as a true gentleman, he did not want to say no to the people he had already committed to today, or else he'd be here with us today. But we want to thank him publicly because he immediately, when the first video surfaced, he demanded answers and a whole long list of answers from Planned Parenthood CEO Cecile Richards. He's also demanding answers from the U.S. Attorney General Loretta Lynch. And he's also demanding answers from not just the sellers of the baby parts, but he's demanding answers from those that are buying the baby parts. We thank Senator Joni Ernst, 
who's been in there, it seems like 20 minutes, right? And she's already shaking up the U.S. Senate. We thank her for her bipartisan support that she received going after information from Secretary Burwell with the, Uni with the United States Health and Human Services. We thank her for her leadership in the United States Senator leading the charge on defunding Planned Parenthood, and not only just defunding Planned Parenthood, but rightfully so stripping them of $500 million a year of our dollars, our dollars, and not only just stripping them, but letting that money go into true community health centers that offer services, everything except abortion. And I think, <laughs> I know that abortion is not health care. While we fell a few vo votes short this time, we were closer than we were last time to defund Planned Parenthood, and we will get it done the next time, and if not the next time, you better believe it's going to happen in very short order. Because as we've seen here today, pro-life and pro-choice alike, those that have never thought about the issue one way or the other, those that are Christians, that are atheists, that are of every faith walk, are here today with us to stand up and say, enough is enough. I also want to thank every single speaker who spoke before me this morning and the council of countless leaders who have stood up across this state and across this country and those that will stand up in the very near future for their leadership in demanding that Planned Parenthood be defunded and fully investigated. And it's happening both on the national and the state levels. This. This is our harvest moment. Those of us that have been in this work for decades, for, for years, for months, this is one of those moments, the harvest that we have been working for. And we stand united, shoulder to shoulder. And I would, last but absolutely not least, I want to thank every single one of you for being here today. I want to thank you for taking a stand here at this rally and in your lives. I thank you for saying enough is enough. Planned Parenthood is not an organization to be trusted with our daughters, our granddaughters, our sisters, or our friends. United, and here's what I need you to do. It's awesome. I love coming to rallies. But it's one day. And we need this rally cry to go home with you. And here's what. I had a whole list of action steps that I was going to ask you to do today. You can find that list on our website, Iowa Right to Life. I'm going to ask you to do one thing today. I'm going to ask you to stand, as we've heard from Governor Branstad, Lieutenant Governor Reynolds, I'm going to ask you, bright and early Monday morning, call, email, write a letter, let Attorney General Tom Miller hear, enough is enough. Even if Planned Parenthood CEOs and employees are your closest friends, you need to launch a full, unfettered, complete investigation into Planned Parenthood of the Heartland to make certain that this is not happening in any of our clinics. And we need to make sure that a wholly unregulated, 100% unregulated, is the abortion industry in Iowa. And I'll say this. If Planned Parenthood had nothing to hide, they should say, thank you, Attorney General Tom Miller. Welcome in. We'll show you that we're not doing this. <laughs> Who can say for certain that our precious unborn babies are not being harvested for parts here in Iowa? We know that the medical director for Planned Parenthood of the Heartland, Jill Meadows in Iowa City, dismembers our unborn babies alive. This is not my opinion. This was her testimony before the U.S. Supreme Court in Carhart, Carhart versus Gonzalez. She remains the Planned Parenthood medical director, and she remains in Iowa City 
also training our University of Iowa medical students. So today, I again ask you to do at least this one thing. Call, write, tell Tom Miller the time to investigate Planned Parenthood of the Heartland is now. Finally, yes, there is a finally. Finally, thank you for standing up for the countless unborn babies and their mothers who are at risk, physically and emotionally, every time they seek help at Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood must stop all harvesting and trafficking of unborn babies. Keep the truth-telling pressure up. We are all on the side of truth, and truth, no matter how long and how difficult the journey, truth always wins. I would encourage those that have not had a chance as we leave here, when Simon closes us up in a few moments, we have a small booth over here at the top of the stairs. We've got the Stop the War on Babies t-shirts that are available for purchase. We have a petition that we're, again, united together to defund and investigate Planned Parenthood immediately. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for making history with us today. May thousands of lives be spared because we stood together and said enough is enough. Thank you. Jennifer Bowen, we wouldn't be here without her today, trust me. All right, we're almost done. Tree people over there, I have not forgotten you all day. Thank you very much for coming out, we really appreciate it. Tree people over here, likewise, and all the people behind us as well. I've known you've been there all day. And to the warriors in the middle here who stood out in the sun for uh, two and a bit hours, thank you too. I appreciate it. I want to tell you a very, very quick story. About 25 years ago, a friend of mine, 19, married, didn't know what Planned Parenthood was, was driving around, thought she might be pregnant. She went into a Planned Parenthood, took a pregnancy test, it came out, it was positive, she was so excited, she was so happy, until the Planned Parenthood person turned around to her and said, so, you want to keep it or you want to get rid of it? This organization, pretends to be something it is not. The curtain has now been pulled back and we can see what it is. One of the key parts of the battle is not allowing them to own the language. I say this on the air all the time. Once you own the language, you own the argument. This has got nothing whatsoever to do with women's reproductive health. Nothing. I am so grateful that you all came out today on a beautiful Saturday morning here in Iowa. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Do more than one thing. It's great being here. If you go home and forget about this, it doesn't matter that you were here. It really doesn't. I plead with every single one of you, every day, in five minutes, every single day, you can write one email and make one phone call. And I don't care who you make it to. You can make it to Tom Miller. You can make it to the governor. You can make it to your state rep. You can make it to Democrats. I don't care. One letter, one phone call, five minutes every day. This is what they listen to. I promise you, you blow up their phones. This is what they listen to. So please, please, please do that for me. Finally, I want it to be as clear as it can possibly be. Defunding Planned Parenthood, great. They need investigating. There are people that need to go to jail, need to go to jail, and we need to shut it down. Yeah. Tell your kids you were here, ladies and gentlemen. I mean that sincerely. Today's day one, we start today. We do not end with one nice rally. We have to keep working. May God bless all of you, every single one of you who came out. 
May God bless the great state of Iowa. May God continue to bless these United States of America. Thank you very much.